Welcome to the second part of the module on Java concurrency mechanisms. Now that we've explored the basics of Java concurrency in part one, this part delves deeper into the structure and functionality of Java threads. Even if you're already familiar with Java threads, you may learn something from this video since we discuss various thread implementation aspects of the Android software stack. A thread is a complex piece of software that interacts with other hardware and software entities. To get a bird's eye view of these interactions, the state machine on this slide depicts the key states of a thread during its life cycle which are documented in this link. Although you don't need to know all these details to program Java threads effectively, we'll walk through each state to help you better understand a thread's behavior and interactions. When a Java program creates a thread object, it's initially in the new state. After the program calls the start method on the thread, the state machine transitions to the runnable state. When the Android Linux scheduler selects the thread to execute, it transitions to the running state at which point the Java virtual machine invokes its run hook method to start executing user-provided code. If this user code calls sleep or other timed operations, the state machine transitions to the timed waiting state for the designated period of time. When this wait time elapses, the thread becomes runnable again. After the thread scheduler starts running the thread, it might attempt to access a guarded resource, such as a synchronized method or block, protected by a lock which will transition the thread to the block state if the lock is not available. When the resource is obtained, the thread becomes runnable again. After the thread scheduler starts running the thread, it might wait on a condition variable, causing the state machine to transition to the waiting state. When another thread notifies this condition variable, the thread again becomes runnable. Finally, when a thread's run method returns, the thread is terminated and its resources are released by the Java virtual machine. This link contains a UML state chart visualizing and summarizing all these states. The two most fundamental phases of a Java thread's lifecycle involve starting and stopping it. So we'll examine these phases in the remainder of this video since they raise some interesting implementation issues. We'll start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. When start is called on a thread object, the Java virtual machine allocates the resources needed to execute the thread and then calls its run hook method. Many steps occur at the Java middleware, virtual machine, and operating system layers to make all this happen. Again, you don't need to understand all these details to program Java threads effectively, but the following discussion will help you appreciate what the Android software stack is doing on your program's behalf. Moreover, the source files containing each implementation step are shown at the bottom of each slide. When a program invokes the start method on a thread object, it's actually invoking the start method of the underlying Java thread class, which in turn calls the VM thread create native method, which triggers several calls to other Java native interface and Dalvik internal methods that ultimately invoke pthread create, which is a standard POSIX function that interacts with the Linux kernel to create a runtime stack and other pthread resources. For brevity, we skip these kernel st steps in our analysis. The interp thread start function is passed to pthread create, which then invokes this function in the context of the newly created thread. Interp thread start calls the Dalvik internal DVM call method, which subsequently invokes the thread object's run hook method to execute user defined code. Of course, all these Android implementation details are subject to change. For example, this link contains a brief summary of the new Android runtime called ART that's provided as an experimental option in the Android 4.4 release. ART replaces the register-based interpreter in Dalvik with ahead of time processing in which bytecode is pre-compiled into machine language when an application is installed on an Android device. Now that we've covered how threads get started and run, let's cover the other end of the life cycle where we bid them farewell. Stopping Java threads is surprisingly hard, just like the classic animated film The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which shows how it's often easier to set things in motion than it is to shut them down. In particular, other than returning from run, there's no built-in safe method for involuntarily stopping a Java thread in Android. The stop method has been deprecated for the reasons described at this link. Therefore, if a thread performs long duration operations, programmers should ensure it can stop itself voluntarily. One way to instruct a long duration operation in a thread to shut down is to use a stop flag. The my runnable implementation on this slide 
contains a volatile Boolean flag called is stopped that's initially set to false. The Java volatile type qualifier enforces a global ordering on reads and writes to a variable so it can be used correctly in a multi-threaded program, as described at this link. MyRunnable also defines a stop me method that sets is stopped to true. Finally, the run method periodically checks is stopped to see if the thread's been instructed to stop itself and returns if it has. Although this solution is lightweight, it isn't integrated into the Java virtual machine. Therefore, it won't wake up blocking operations such as reads, waits, joins, sleeps, or interruptible locks, which will impede the shutdown process. Another way to stop a thread is to use the standard Java interrupt method, which posts a request to a thread asking it to stop what it's doing and do something else, as described in this link. For example, the main thread shown on this slide creates and starts a new thread T1, whose run hook method performs several types of processing in a loop. When the main thread wants thread T1 to stop, it calls T1's interrupt method. For the Java thread interruption mechanism to work correctly, code running in thread T1, or a method called directly or indirectly by code in T1, must check if it has a pending interrupt request and handle the request accordingly. There are two ways for a thread to check and handle interrupt requests. If a thread frequently calls blocking methods, such as wait, join, sleep, and lock interruptibly, as well as IO operations on an interruptible channel, these methods internally check if they've been interrupted, and if so, they automatically throw the interrupted exception, which can be caught and handled in the appropriate context. Conversely, threads whose computations don't invoke methods that throw the thread interrupted exception must periodically call the thread interrupted method, which returns true if an interrupted request has been received, thereby allowing the program to return or throw an interrupted exception. Despite the name, Java thread interrupts don't behave like traditional operating system interrupts. In particular, they aren't delivered asynchronously and preemptively. Instead, thread interrupt just sets an internal flag that must be tested for explicitly via calls to thread interrupted, which clears this flag. This link examines the Java thread interruption mechanism in more detail. Both solutions we examined for stopping threads require the threads to cooperate by checking periodically to see if they've been instructed to stop and voluntarily shutting themselves down if so. Although this approach can be tedious to program, it's the recommended way of stopping threads in Java and Android, as described at this link. In summary, Java threads are implemented using various mechanisms provided by the lower layers of the Android software stack. Although the implementation details of Dalvik differ a bit from other Java virtual machines, the features of Java threads on Android should be familiar to experienced Java developers. This link provides more information on Dalvik and summarizes characteristics that differentiate it from other standard Java virtual machines. However, due to the programming level similarities between Android's implementation of Java threads and other Java virtual machines, you might consider reading some good books on Java concurrency to learn the key patterns and best practices of programming multi-threaded Java software. These books will help you to master creating, managing, and using Java threads on a range of platforms, including Android.